Hello and welcome back to the women's show. It feels like we've not done this for ages. Uh, I'm Chris Brack and once again I'm joined by my friends Philippa Smallwood, Emma Sanders and Neil Axon. How are we all? Very good yeah, indeed. Thanks. I know. I think last time I saw you and we were, you were just about to get ready for the, for the Euros. Yes, yes. A very, very busy time but an incredible month and um, we're still talking about it which is really good so... Yeah, yeah well, so, uh, seeing I've not had a chance to talk about it, so we'll, have a, we'll have a bit of a chat about it anyway. Um, so, from your obviously, you've been covering the women's game for ages. Uh, what was it like of covering a home Euros and watching England go on to win it? Yeah, I mean, it was a dream come true, really. It's the type of thing when you when you do the job that I do, you just hope that you get those big moments. And before the tournament, you know, hearing from the players, seeing we were very much involved in the camp. You get really, really sucked into it all. So you sort of see every detail and you get to really know the characters and kind of the feeling. And I've never felt the same kind of optimism around one sort of England team, you know, men's or women's um, ever. Um, so I think it was one of those where we, we knew that something special could happen deep down, but there was always that kind of, I don't know, British kind of pessimism that came in as you know as the the first game neared and you thought oh everything's there it's too perfect like surely something's going to go wrong and then that first game against Austria wasn't you know wasn't quite the sort of the the, the showcase performance I guess that that we were almost hoping for from England fans and we were like oh see here we go you know all that kind of perfection and but even then at the same time it still felt very calm because it was Serena Beekman at the helm and you know it was it was almost like a sense of it, it'll be fine like she'll yeah. she'll work it out and then as as the tournament went on and you know the whole thing just blew both from a work perspective you know I was getting demands that have kind of never come come on to me before <laughs> work which which was really really cool but also very stressful and tiring um but yeah and then obviously like the the kind of the reaction from the fans and just even things like the interaction on social media, like I'd never kind of had the same um, interaction to simple things like, a, a, you know, a tweet to do with the England team, like the extent of that just went kind of through the roof. And yeah, I bumped into another journalist who who doesn't work in women's football at, at Anfield a week or two ago. And and he said that that he'd been following the game and, and the Euros in particular and, and my work and just was blown away by kind of, yeah, the interest and, and the interaction of it all, and and he he got properly soaked up into it. So yeah, a magical month, and um, yeah, it will always be one of the, the highlights of my career because seeing England win a major trophy is obviously uh, a rare thing. Well, it's only happened twice. It's only happened twice, <laughs> but, you know. So it's one of those things you get to see. Uh, I mean, Philip, yeah. I think you and me were so we sort of bookended the Euros. <laughs> so we both went to the Manchester one uh, separately, and then we uh, I managed lucky enough to get tickets to the final. You know, so I also took my daughter. She was enthralled by it. She thought the whole thing was great. She just thinks that's what you do when you go to football to just keep winning finals. I, I've got to educate her. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like Emma said, you know, the first game was a bit of a nervy one, I think, and I think. You know, I, I was a bit like Emma. I felt like we we really did have a chance to to win the tournament, but I felt it all came down to whether or not we could cope with the pressure, I think. And um, mm. that first game was a little bit, you know, it Edgy. made you question. Yeah, it made you question whether or not they would be able to handle it or not. Um, but maybe it was, it was the perfect start, really, because you want your team to kind of like build into a tournament. Um, you know, maybe if they'd have started with the, the Norway game where they... They were absolutely battered them. You know, it may have been slightly different if you then go into the Austria game and it's a bit more mm. nervy. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I took in a lot of the Euros. I did all the the Northwest um, matches, and I fully enjoyed it. Every single game was really entertaining. The atmospheres were brilliant. Just seeing, you know, the the fans for both sides in all of those games. Um, you know, and just taking in those atmospheres and sitting amongst those fans, um, the Iceland fans in particular for me were just something else. Um, you know, you can tell that they come from like a small country and are, are probably, you know, <laughs> achieving things far beyond what they should be able to achieve with the number of uh, participants that they have over there. It, it was just, it was just something special and you know, they enjoyed every single minute. I don't think they won a game in the end. I think they drew th all three games um, and got knocked out in the group stages. But it was just, 
it just felt like a bit of a party that just all the way through, you know, every, every single game that I went to, the, you know, it was just a really, really good experience um, and something like Emma, you know, that I'll never, ever forget. And obviously, yeah, yeah England winning was uh, the icing on the cake, I suppose. Yeah, and it helps. I mean, look, I don't think there was a nil. I don't think there was a nil-nil in any of the games, which always makes it entertaining because you know that's what people want to see. Uh, and I also think it was it was a really good final. You know, Ger- Germany made England work for it. And look, the only part of it you felt from a tournament was a bit sad was the other top goal scorer um, got injured in the warm up. Uh, listen, if you're an England fan, you may you're probably happy because she was a real threat. But you know, for a spectacle, that's what you probably would have liked to see. But as a final, it was. End to end, it was they've won it, they've not won it. Germany on top, you know, it, a very typical final. Because I mean, Neil, we've watched enough finals, not just England, but you know, with Liverpool in general, and they sort of can be quite dire games. So the fact that it was a, an entertaining final it helped. I mean, tour as a whole, I thought was really good football, really entertaining, and for a lot of the England players, I wonder if that's where some of these big moves have come off the back of it. Because I think we've had two moves to Barcelona now. And I think Stanway's moved to Bayern Munich as well. Yeah, I think that that will have happened. People will have seen what they've done in the tournaments and and will react accordingly. Um, I think that the you know, I think the, I think the whole thing feeling like a real set piece for people, a real showcase. I think both in terms of sort of internally within the women's game, but also obviously the most important thing, certainly in this country, is externally for for, for the general sort of football watching public as a whole. And the idea that within that that the games were at levels of entertainment about them. I, I never got going on it. I've been really honest about it. I think it was a hangover from a long season in Paris. Uh, I was really, really struggling all until about the, the quarters or semis to engage and that was obviously you know I've, I've come and do this show and all that it wasn't a women's football thing far from it it was just simply being just feeling done in uh by by the idea of watching competitive football um i just could, did not have the gear change uh within me what was brilliant to then sort of all get to observe though very much as a third party like i felt as though seeing the outpouring in a slightly d- detached way because of the fact that i hadn't been engaged with it in a way, sort of made me uh, made me appreciate it a tiny little bit more. And what I mean by that is, there's a lot of people who've been who've worked ever so hard. Emma is one of them. Uh, Philippa, in a non professional capacity, is another, who have very much waited for that moment in every single way. And by that moment, I don't just mean winning the final. I mean like the idea that the the way of talking and writing about this game is as significant as talking or writing about any other. And I think that that was sort of seeing that in a detached capacity in in a really weird way made me sort of appreciate that and the, the, the sacrifices and choices that have gone with it a little bit more uh, by the time that it all finally comes around. But, you know, as I say, for me on that sort of, that that sort of suddenly it's July and I can't believe this is happening where it was genuinely how I felt um, was, you know, it, it was... Uh, it, it, it was never something I felt like I was in the teeth of, um, but every bit of football that I did catch, I think, was was a really good advertisement for the for, for the sheer quality of those players. And also, I thought it was really intriguing bits and pieces that I managed to watch in a bit of a detached way around the setups as well. I think there was a few bits of setups that I thought were really, really fascinating. Cool, cool. So let's talk about Liverpool because let's be honest, that's what we all want to talk about, and we all enjoy talking about Liverpool. So WSL finally. Back where, back where we want to be. So, Philippa, how excited are you for the WSL? I'm really excited. Um, I think, you know, they're the, the kind of like the hangover from the relegation um, three seasons ago. Um, we'll live long, um, and I don't ever want to go through that ever again. Um, and I think the, the team last season more than showed that it's capable of being very competitive in this league. Um you know, we all know that, you know, the very top of the league is going to be very, very hard for, for the likes of Liverpool this season to be able to break into. But beyond that, I think that, you know, that we shouldn't be scared of anybody beyond like the first four, maybe five teams. Because um, Tottenham, you know, since they've been promoted, have, have made great strides for me. And I think it's it's the sort of thing that we should be looking to, to kind of emulate. Um, and I think, you know, it's it's something that we as fans, you know, going through last season and seeing, you know, the positive energy around the club again, you know, just the build up into um, the promotion to carry that on into the WSL is is something that I'm really excited about. Um, you know, we know that, you know, the fan base has kind of 
took on a little bit more of another level with the flags being introduced, et cetera. And, you know, it's something that I'm quite heavily involved in and, and that has really helped, I think, my enjoyment of the game. Um, you know, there's often when I was going to the women's games and you're kind of just taking it in, you're not really engaged um, in the same way as you are with the men's game. And I think that's something that, that I'm looking forward to in the WSL and, and seeing a lot of, of star quality players, I would say, even, you know, that are playing for the opposition. I think, you know, that's something that we can we can really look forward to this season as well. Yeah, I mean, Emma, looking at sort of pre-season, you know, if you're using that as a gauge, you know, Liverpool have played against sides who they will be playing against in the WSL and sort of more than held their own, you know, and it sort of, it does give you that positive side of, look, we, you know, they're not all, it's pre-season and you can be eluded by pre-season, but the fact you are really competitive with the West Ham's, the Man United, the Villas, you know, holding City to a 1-1 at the Etihad. I mean, all the time that would be for Liverpool women, uh, Neil. Yes, I'm um, so sorry. So sorry. sorry. I'm going to have to pause this. We've, I've just got announced when the Queen's died, so I'm going to have to... Can you just give me two minutes? I just need to make sure, like, any scheduled tweets and any scheduled stories aren't going out. Just give me yeah, two yeah. minutes. It's all right. Break the time down. I'll, I'll update it. Um... Sorry, I could see this coming. That's why I was like, shit. <laughs> There was about, um, between me and you, Leicester had a signing that was getting announced in half an hour and uh, there was another one there. I was like, shit, better. Let me just email the um, Okay, right. Good. Was that a long way, by the way, in the background? I know, can they like drilling or something? Yeah. It's all, that's here, it's here, there's, there's, yeah. there's work happening, don't worry, that's here. Um, yeah, it's not like really now. But... Give me one second, I've got, to, I've got to do something not so similar to Emma, give me two minutes max. Yeah, yeah, no problems, no problems. Hello. Okay, get to edit it, it's all be alright. Sorry Chris, I, I realise you're in the middle of your, answer, of your question, but I just thought... No, it's alright. When you restart, um, I'll probably want you to re-ask it anyway, so I was like... No, no, it's fine, what I'll do is... Um, Gab's a, Gab's a wizard editing anyway, so I'll just say as soon as Phillips finished that question, I've wrote the times, about 11 minutes in. Yeah. I'll write down when we restart. No, it's fine. Um, between me and you, we've had a message from Chelsea's press saying that they're going to hold sending out. This happened about 15 minutes ago, saying they were going to hold sending out accreditation. Um whether or not we've been confirmed, which they've left it very late. So that makes me think. And then, so we got that message about 10 minutes before we then had the official. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, is, is, yeah, I think so, which is, um, copy helps. People are already messaging me, private messaging me now. It's yeah. United game called off. I'm not going to fucking tell you that, am I? <laughs> you, you're uh, the fount of all knowledge, Emma. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, Emma, your little mate was... My, your little mate was annoyed when we went to the final. I said, so will that, will, will that be able to say hello to me? I said, I don't think so, sweetheart. It's 90,000 people. I think she's probably in the press box. Oh, bless. Bless so, she, so he was a bit miffed. I said, I'm, I'm sure Emma will come and say hello to you at the next game. Well, definitely. Saw, definitely come and say before the derby. Yeah. I saw hello. Emma uh, at the, uh, should we call it a parade? Yeah. The, at Trafalgar <laughs> Square. <laughs> They all oh, going, cool. is that him? And I was like, yeah. yeah. Oh, you should have said, someone waved. That reminds me of the dub. I need to, I need to message Debs, actually. I think yeah. I think we, we did that parade on about three hours sleep. We weren't drunk because we we didn't we didn't get to Fox Park from Wembley until like obviously about quarter to twelve. We only had about yeah. an hour there. So we did about five shots, literally as soon as we came in. <laughs> um and then just we were just singing and dancing, like everyone was singing like the Serena Beekman song. So yeah, we were at we were sort of out of there by two, but we were just sort of, you know, kind of walking around this, you know, Wembley and whatever. So you can't probably, sleep either, can you? Because you've just nah. got the adrenaline high, haven't well, you? that and we obviously had loads of work. So, so yeah, <laughs> so we couldn't see. So we got yeah. back. I think I got back to my hotel room at three and we got to stick to the radio. And then I think, I think, about half seven, so. Yeah, I think for the final, Olivia was up at six. We got a train at seven. 
and we got back to the hotel. She has something to eat, and I think we got back to the hotel room about quarter to twelve. Yeah. And at half twelve, she went. That was it then. But she was on I the go. go the whole time. She didn't Lesson. stop. <laughs> right. Cool. Right. Put that in. Fifteen thirty. Um, okay. Right. Captain for Gav. Okay. Uh, three, two, one. So Emma, uh, pre-season. I know pre-season that we can't take fully in the results, but I mean, looking at the um, results we got there, you know, we've got some good results against teams who will be in and around the likes of West Ham and Aston Villa. You know, narrow defeat to Man United, but holding Man City to a draw uh, at the Etihad. I mean, listen, not the Etihad, the Etihad, uh, their stadium. But all the times I've watched Liverpool women against Man City, it's just a slog. So yeah. these are all real positives that you sort of plus size going. Liverpool will be a lot more. We're going to be competitive in this league, you know. So which let me and Philip are, don't have as much apprehension, hopefully. Yeah, no, I've been really, really impressed with Liverpool's preseason actually, and I don't usually really look into preseason in. You know, maybe maybe I've sort of caught the cliches from from the players themselves, but I I very much see it as pre-season as one of those where you know you try loads of things out and it's it's it is kind of like a training session. But um, Liverpool have very specifically chosen opposition that are on paper higher um, than than Liverpool, so you know they were hoping to get challenges, they were hoping to be tested. And they've not looked, as you say, out of place in the slightest. And you know, I could argue that they've they've looked a level above some of those some of those teams. Certainly, um, West Ham, they were comfortably the better team. Um, you know, and that's that's a side that that up until um, transfer deadline day had some had some real sort of quality players. Um, so I think you know, I think that's that's only a good thing. And they showed last season as well, Liverpool in, in this in those cup matches. Um, that one against Tottenham in particular in the Conti Cup that that they can certainly hold their own against against these WSL teams. So um, I think it's been really, really positive pre-season. And um, I'm really excited, actually, to see just how well they, they can do. I have absolutely no concerns um, that they'll be anywhere near sort of relegation zone. I'm not worried about Liverpool and the slightest in terms of that. So I think it's a free hit for them this season to just kind of express themselves and do as, you know, do as well as they can against those, those sort of, you know, higher up teams. And if they can finish, I think anywhere sort of between ninth and sixth in the table, then um, then that's a good season. So yeah, um, really, really encouraging summer, I think. Yeah, I mean Neil, that's that's sort of the expectation for the WSL this year. It, it, we we all know it's going to be a, a, a tough slog because, as you pointed out, you know one big benefit in the championship is we were a lot fitter than everybody else, so we were able to go for longer. You're not really going to have that advantage in WSL because. The quality is there, the fitness is there, but the fact we are looking so competitive in all these preseason games against very established up your sides, it does give you sort of the belief going. You know, Liverpool are going to be competitive this year and should be looking more up than down. I think that that's fair. I think that there's there's a couple of little things here, you know, and I think looking at the last season's WSL table is quite is quite instructive. So Everton, after twenty two games, win five, but they're never really in danger. They finish tenth. And then if you go up to Tottenham, who Philip appraised earlier on, out of 22 games, they win nine and they get 32 points. And obviously, we're never really in trouble, but we're never really able to sort of look to the, to the sides above them. And I think that's where Liverpool have got to sort of pitch the tent, winning somewhere between five and let's just say 10 of the 22 games is where Liverpool have got a... That, that's what, firstly, that's the minimum sort of requirements in there because, you know, if they win five, you would think they wouldn't end up in trouble uh, come the end of the campaign and, and should be relatively comfortable throughout much of it. And I think that, that that's what the preseason sort of suggests. You know, if you go through and you look at look at what results are in there, that all feels eminently achievable. Um and let's be clear about this and 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 you know let's be real about it. What we're talking about there then is is basically winning somewhere give or take one of 33% of your games. You know, seven wins uh is you know is 33% of the games. So if Liverpool win, you know, win eight or nine, uh, then that's that's doing really, really well. And I, I think that that's, that's got to be borne in mind. And each of those wins has therefore got to be savoured and celebrated as part of that. You know, there, there are few bad, there will be few bad points over the course of the season with Liverpool. There'll be few bad draws. And that's got to be remembered as well. And none of this is, none of this is trying to sort of downwardly man, sort of measure expectations. It really isn't. It's more, this is the scope and the scale of the challenge that Liverpool Liverpool have got. And that's what they're going to have to sort of deal with and live within. 
And then from there, that's why the preseason becomes obviously encouraging. You know, you look at the size that they face there and the way in which those results have gone. If they manage to replicate that over the course of the campaign, then that's precisely what we would end up sort of looking at. We'd end up looking at those sorts of numbers. We'd end up saying, yep, you know, that's been a, a pretty solid campaign. And then if within that as well, there's, you know, there's room for either a cup run or there's room for a couple of really victories that pave the way for the future then that's also part of what this is. This is very much sort of working out pathways uh, as much as it's anything else. And this is this is the, you know, the, the first leg of the journey has been done. And now that the idea is to get a really good handhold to then build and work out how to get to the very top of the mountain. And that's not going to happen overnight and no one thinks it is. So, yeah, I think that the, the can be looking upwards is, is my thing here. But there's the minimum requirement first. Mm. And I think that Liverpool, you know, I want Liverpool to have a moment where it is perfectly legitimate to get carried away. And that's important. It would be lovely to have a carried away moment. But to do that, you've got to acknowledge what you, where it is we're getting carried away from. And that's five wins out of 22 is where we'd be getting carried away from. And where we get carried away to is, say, 10 wins out of 22. And that's all absolutely sound. And 10 wins out of 22 would be amazing. Man United win 12 last season and finish fourth. They're just a, a, a difficult side to beat on top of everything else. 10 wins would be amazing. So winning fewer than just fewer than half the games would be absolutely amazing. So let's just accept that and say, right, mm -hmm. when they come, they're the great afternoons. They're the great evenings. They're the ones that we really, really enjoy. And then hopefully there's some hard four points along the way that they pick up. And then from there, what we're able to do when we're doing the show, when we're having the conversations, when we're having them, when we're in, in Prenton Park in February, is saying it looks like this season's just going to curve its way out. That'd be amazing. That's literally like winning the trophy. And I think yeah. that that's the key thing. That's like winning the trophy. If by February you're going, ah, oh, there's not a lot riding on the rest of these games. That's amazing. You know, that would be amazing if Liverpool can reach that point. And I think that that's what we've got to be excited about. They've almost got to find a way to make the last two, three months of the season an opportunity to experiment and for us to find them a little bit boring. If they've done that, they've yeah. won. If they've done that, that's the win. And I think that that's the important thing to, to just put over and over and over again. Which then enables them to sort of plan earlier into yeah. year two, year three, because you're not already going. We're already at WSL side year two, so we can plan for whatever the next evolution is. I mean, Philip, we're looking at the transfers ins and outs you know outside looking in you know it, they look smart signings they look what you need uh, a nice mix of WCL experience a bit of youth and excitement and it looks like Liverpool are going with a plan which look you you know me a lot longer than I'll be doing this podcast uh I've been very critical of how Liverpool were organized probably two three years ago because it never felt like there was a plan you know we were used to eight nine players going every summer this is more of a looks a lot more strategic. The players who have left, you can understand where they've gone or why they've not been brought along any further on the journey. And the players they brought in are really exciting. Yeah, and I'll be honest, I'm really made up with the Charlotte Wardlow re-signing today. Um, I thought just, she was excellent for us last season. Yeah, just um, keep behind the curtain. This is deadline day when we when I, <laughs> when I organise this, which Emma is absolutely made up with me with it. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Um, yeah, I was made up with that because I, I thought she's exactly the sort of player um, that we should be looking towards for the future as well. Um, you know, obviously Chelsea think a lot of her because they've signed her again on a, a three-year contract as well. So um, the fact that Chelsea, who were probably the most um, structured side, I would say, the most well-built side within the, pre within the Premier League, within the WSL, I think they're exactly the sort of side that if, if they're think thinking high things of a player, then then it's something uh, really good to look at. And we know from watching her last season what a talented player she is. So, um, yeah. And then, you know, Shanice van der Sanden as well, who we, we've had at the club previously and who played really, really well for us. You know, she's she's probably the bit of the star quality, I think, that we've signed um, to really drive us forward and, and create chances for us. Um, and Coy Visto, um, I think, was a really shrewd signing. Um, somebody who maybe we weren't looking at um, as fans, as somebody to come in. But I think she's she's shown over pre-season what a quality player she is. And even in the in the Euros, I think you know watching Finland play, she was she was probably one of their standout players. So um, I'm really excited about the new signings. Um, and like you touched on, I think you know the players that have have left us um, were players who probably weren't playing an awful lot for us anyway. Um, so that what we've managed to do is is keep hold of players who who weren't, you know, the nucleus of the squad that we had last season, 
um, the players that we relied on to get us into the WSL, and we've added quality to that. And I think, I think that can only stand us in good stead for the in good stead for this season. Yeah, I mean Emma, I mean the other signing we've done is uh, Jill Flaherty, who uh, former West Ham captain. Uh, I think she's played for Arsenal, played for Chelsea, won, won pretty much everything. Uh, if you've seen the BBC show Squad Goals, she takes no messing. Uh, she'll she'll tell you to your, she'll tell you to your face if you're crap. Which <laughs> I'll be honest, I'm all I'm all for that because I think that's how sport should be. You you can be that bl- brutally honest, but it's another leader to go on top of the Nifahis, the Rachel Finesses. You know, it gives you that solidity, and then also it takes pressure off the captain as well. So it gives us a, a rotation. So if the captain needs a rest, look at the experience you're bringing in, or you start on both of them for experience in the big games. Yeah, I think Jilly Fatu was. Uh... I think it's an interesting signing because it was one that, um, like, obviously she's achieved a lot in her career and and deserves, you know, a lot of respect. But I guess, you know, given the direction of the club and the amount of defenders and the amount of experienced players, certainly in that position, I was quite surprised that we went for someone that was, you know, older um, in Jilly that's obviously kind of been in and around the WSL for a while. Um, I, I, th- I thought we might, you know, perhaps look towards maybe a younger player in that department just because we have got so many defenders. So I was I was surprised by that. Um, but having kind of spoken to, I spoke to Jilly um, earlier at Prentham Park this week, um, obviously spoken to lots of people at, at Liverpool in and around the club um, about their kind of, you know, the decisions over over her signing and, and others, obviously. And I think there's a general sense in the club that, She's she's got a very strong relationship with Matt Beard, obviously, when from their time together at West Ham. Um, and that there's a few other staff members at Liverpool now that have obviously come over with Matt. And I think they worked very well with Jilly at the time and she excelled under their their staff, basically. And um I think certainly from speaking to her, she believes that kind of the best football that she's played, certainly in the latter start the latter parts of her career, have been under kind of Matt Beard and she feels like she's got a little bit more freedom when she plays under him. So um, you know, I am interested to see how she gets on uh, with the likes of kind of Nifahi and Meg Campbell and, and Jazz Matthews and, and those players who really, really excelled for Liverpool last season that are experienced players that have got that that WSL experience as well. So it's almost like we've kind of we've added that depth, which for me is 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 exciting, um, really, really exciting. But yeah, I'm just interested to see how how Matt Beard almost manages the squad there because I think that's that's a challenge which. Um, you know, it's it's a positive challenge. It's one of those that you get from having a, a good squad, from having success. And because we played so well as a squad in the championship and because a lot of these players are so experienced and, and deserve their opportunity, um, you then, you know, in order to improve the squad for this season, you then add in players that are arguably of, of the same level, if not slightly better. Um, and therefore, there's going to be a lot of competition for places. So, um, Jilly, I think, will be one of those players that has come in, obviously, wanting game time. Um, but so will Nifahi, so will Meg Campbell, so will Jazz Matthews. So how Matt handles that, um, I'm really, really intrigued to see. And obviously Leanne Rove as well, who's who signed a new contract. So yeah, lots of options there. Yeah, we sort of points maybe we're we're sticking with the you know, the five, two, three formation. Maybe that's the reason for depth is they're gonna gonna be needed a lot. But uh Neil, going back to Shanice van der Sanden, uh, I mean for people who don't know who Shanice van der Sanden is, this is somebody who has won Three Champions Leagues, you know, uh-huh. played for Leon, played for played for Wolfsburg, still only thirty, was great in a first spell at Liverpool. You know, gives you that bit of an X factor. But again, it, it's competition out wide now. You have got her, you have got Mel Lawley, Keenan, and you've got Yada Daniels as well. So it also gives you that little bit of a more competition out wide. I think yeah, very much so. And I think it's another you know another marker in the idea that this is going to be the five two three uh, over the course of the campaign. I think there's no. No escaping from that. Um, that that's that that's the shape and the, the expectation Liverpool have got. Uh, and I think that Liverpool will see themselves as obviously having upgraded the competition in the area uh, by virtue of bringing Van der Sanden in. And um, you know, I think she she'll she she'll be coming here expecting to start. That's not to say she'll be complacent about it, but she will be expecting that she she you know she is has a start and birth. So one would expect from the first game it'll be her and, and Mel Lawley fitness permitting uh, either side of one forward, um, which. Let's be clear about this. And an, an important part of the expects to start thing is to, to to revert to something that happened a lot last season. Um, 
one of the things Matt Beard did really, really well was bring different players to the party at different times. One of the things those players themselves did really well was bring themselves to the party at different times and and pass a baton on around performance. And I think that's also aided in the universe as well, where Matt's got five subs to work with. So, you know, I think I think you may well see a lot of a lot of certain players uh, flitting between 60 and 30. That said, I don't think Van der Sander will want herself to even be part of that either. She's got a World Cup squad she want to be part of. Uh, she want to force her way back into that too. So across the board, you know, I think that this does suggest that there's not going to be a grand change from Liverpool. The other thing that the Ward Law signing does as well is whilst it, you know, it suggests that the 5-2-3 is, is there and very, very present, it also suggests that Rihanna Roberts will be performing a lot of the football in the centre of the midfield too. You've ended up now Liverpool between Covisto and Wardlaw with with two uh, right hand sided uh, sort of wing back type footballers who should presumably share the position. Uh, and so I think it's more that Liverpool will feel as though that what that what the Wardlaw signing does is it actually boosts the numbers in the middle of the park in a bit of a funny way uh, around the houses. And I think that'll be really important. You talked earlier on, Chris, about the fitness last season comparable for Liverpool and the fitness this. It's a big, big ask that shape for the two midfielders mm. in the centre of the pitch. You, you've got so much ground to cover and responsibility for, for, for a great deal. Now, it's been interesting in the pre-season games, looking at the reports that supposedly, you know, the, the wing-backs have been coming a little narrower at times and, and becoming a third player in that area because I think that Liverpool will need a little bit of that, but then someone's got to get out. But I think that within there, there's going to be, you know, that's what I think we're looking at. That's the shape that I think he's, he's committed to. But there is a massive burden on these players, and that's why the strength and depth will matter both in the games themselves in terms of using people from the bench, but also across the course of the campaign. Yeah, just something that, that Neil said there that I just wanted to pick up on. A really interesting point about Rian Roberts sort of moving into the midfield position. Um, Charlotte Wardlaw is actually, she is capable of playing in that centre mid position as well. We've seen is her she? play that. Yeah, with the England youth teams, which is very interesting because when I, when I spoke to Matt Beard on record and I asked him, um, you know, what his plans were before the end of the deadline. And he said um, they wanted a fullback. I know that they've been looking for a midfielder, but he said we're hoping to get a fullback midfielder in. And I took it as maybe two positions. And actually, listening back to the audio today, I think he said it in a very specific way, which maybe suggests that by bringing in a fullback, it might perhaps be someone that could also play a midfield as well. Um, so I'm that's one to maybe keep an eye on. She might, mm. she might be getting developed in that position as well. Yeah, she's got the uh, she's got number eight shirt, hasn't she? Which is unusual mm-hmm. number for a fullback as well. So yeah. I just thought coincidental. So yeah, that'd be interesting to see. I mean, oh, again, I wonder if that's part of the reason for the loan is maybe that's a conversation they've had with Emma Hayes as well. Is maybe she sees something like that as well. Mm-hmm. So you, you you never know. Be quite an interesting. But Philip, the other big thing with Liverpool uh, we've seen is uh, lots and lots of contract renewals. You know, so lots yeah. of stability in the club. Lots of you know. Big name players who were great for us last year, we know we're staying for longer. Which again, a they're all deserved because of how they perform. But b then again, it gives you that uh, stability and something to build a base from. Because one sometimes the criticism of the women's game is a lot of the contracts are very short. Most players get a year, if you know, on the contracts. So whereas now, quite a lot again, two year extensions. You know, I think Liam Robe now is in a going to be into a fifth season at Liverpool. You know, it's that sort of thing. It can only be positive as well. Yeah, and I think it it shows, you know, really how far the club has come in the last couple of years because we know ourselves, Chris, you know, the turmoil at the club. You had players who, when they got to the end of the contracts, there was no way they was going to sign a new contract. They couldn't wait to get out of the club in a lot of cases. Um, You know, and things are very different now. And, you know, I think it's great to see that the likes of Taylor Hines, who signed a new contract last season, um, Missy Bo Kearns, you know, those sorts of young players who... For me, we, we we need to be building sides around those players. Um, you know, Taylor Hines for me was probably our one of our standout players last season. And um, you know, it's good that you know she got a three year contract. So yeah, it's it's just really, really encouraging that players want to stay at the club first and foremost, because like I say, we were in a situation where players didn't want to do that for a very long time. And um, to be honest, you you couldn't blame them. Um no. And, you know, the the club have done, I think it's a great credit to the club, you know, the work that they've done behind the scenes, um, you know, Susan Black, you know, Russ Fraser coming in as well now. There just seems to be um, a lot of solidity there. Um, and Matt's been a big part of that as well, I think, um, you know, showing players that, you know, this is a place to be. Um, you know, the fact that we've only just gone up into the WSL, but 
but players want to commit long term to the club is 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 really really positive, and I think as fans we we should embrace it. Yeah, I think I think the, the word the best word to describe Liverpool at the moment is proactive, which is yeah. I'll probably say Liverpool haven't been proactive. Up until probably the last two, three years, Liverpool hadn't been proactive. It was oh, everything felt like a last minute. Oh shit, what's go, what's going what's going on? All our players are leaving. Well, they're all at the end of the contracts. You didn't try and extend any of them, or you know, we've got a game next week and we still haven't organised what we're doing for it. it outside looking at it, I'm sure it, it, it there was organised, but it didn't feel like that. Whereas now you sort of feel like there's a plan, there's something going on. You know, it's all worked to what Matt Beard wants. It's the club and on and off field feel like one, which could is again is only it could only be a positive thing for us. So next season then, um who is your I'll let your name one key player um for the season. Uh go on Philip, I'll let you go first. Uh I think it'll be Kerry Holland. Um I think we're gonna need a, a lot from our midfielders this season. Um you know I think it's gonna be tougher for us obviously in the WSL than what it was in in the championship and I think you know she's she's the real engine in there um and it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see if she actually starts in the first game because I think she got a bit of a knock when she played for for Wales this week um but for me she's 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 got a bit of everything about her game she, you know she's real box to box and I think she's going to be crucial for us uh, this season yeah I think I think I've nicknamed her the engine of the team um Emma who, who are you going for yeah, it's an interesting one because Philippa makes a good point about sort of, you know, I think having that that engine it perhaps is going to be really crucial. But I'm actually going to go maybe a little bit more left field and say I think Katie Stengel because I think our our defence unit and our midfield unit will will work so compactly in terms of you know maybe against against the the, the top teams if you want to call them that in terms of trying to reduce the goals and it might be a case of in those games as Neil said before where you're trying to get a draw or you're trying to hold on to a lead having a striker who maybe might only get one two three chances and being able to put the ball in the back of the net um given you know a few chances i think will be really important so somebody like katie stengel um who's shown that she's really clinical um in the championship if she can do the same in the WSL with far fewer chances um then you know it might be the difference between liverpool sort of picking up a point here and there or you know having a win instead of a draw so um i'm gonna go for kate stengel yeah do you know, I'd have put money in you saying furnace. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Neil. I'll, I'll give you the I'll give you the easy option as in they've already took the best two options I had written down. I think the I think one of the things that these conversations in terms of the previews actually do is it frames that a lot of what Liverpool are about is about pairs. So mm-hmm. a massive deal will be how the pairs of wing backs do. A massive deal will be how the pair of wide forwards do. So with that in mind, I feel as though it's, you know, for me, it's it's Van der Sand and all, all Lawley, if you sort of know what I mean. Mm. I think Liverpool could do with one of them being one of the better attacking players outside the top four. I think if one of them, and it, it's likely to be off the back of a pedigree, Van der Sand, but we've all discussed in the past where Mel Lawley's potential ceiling might be and how high it could be. But I think if one of those two is able to really be a massive problem for defences, then it'd be a huge boost for Liverpool. If two of them, if the pair of them both manage to do that, you know, it's set again, certainly for the for, for the sides outside the top four, if they're able to really cause some trouble and some havoc, then I think that 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 that'll be Liverpool's way home uh, in terms of being able to have an attacking threat. Because I think that there'll be some games where we might, you know, we might be coming and talking afterwards. Where we're a little bit frustrated that we don't feel as though Liverpool got enough bodies forward because they will have to have a really solid base. I think maybe the idea of one wing back crossing to the other one might just be a little bit tougher this season. There might be a little bit less of that because they'll have so much to be conscious of going the other way. Uh, and the idea of the importance of the motor that both of them have got will be there a little bit less. So I think it's, I think it's, we need one of those two in those attacking wide areas to really be able to to have a, a four or five games where we're, we're walking away going, definitely play to the match, no shadow of a doubt. They couldn't live with her, they couldn't deal with her. And if we can have that from both of them, then I think we'll be in really good shape. Very good point. Very good point. Uh, for me, I'll go with Rachel Laws. I mean, she just doesn't like conceding goals, and she's going to be look. She's going to be busier this year, but I think her calmness in and her distribution is going to be key. Uh, and and I just want to see how, how she how she does get in the WSL, given a proper chance, because uh, I just feel like she's the key to it. I mean, signing Eartha Cummings is is an interesting one because she was brilliant in the two games we played against Charleston. She was a nightmare. Um, so again, she's actually got 
some really good competition behind her, you know, a really experienced goal here. But I sort of feel like she'll probably be one of the key players for Liverpool this year. Uh, but look, it's good that we'll talk about it. We're not all pinning our hopes on one player. We are looking going, there's four or five going, that person could do it, that person could do it, that person could do it. And that hasn't always been the case probably two, three years ago where you were going, it's literally one of them two players or I don't know what we're going to do because that's what yeah. we have. So it's a, it's a, a nice place to be in where we're going, oh, there's two or three options here to talk about. So... Yeah, so, I think in terms of like new signings, though, like Emma Corvisto for me, if she comes in and plays the level that she can, I think she can take she can take this team to a, like another level. But yeah, just because of the position she plays, I think it's harder to have an overall impact on the team. But I think quality wise, I th- I'm very very excited about her. I think I think she was a, a brilliant piece of business from Liverpool. If people haven't seen it. Look at the third goal against Blackburn. The breakaway from and the ball from her is ridiculous, and that's playing mm-hmm. left playing on the left because you know. She's, it's not. She's not only good as a right-sided wing back. She's not bad as a left-sided one, which is again yeah. something Matt loves is a player who's flexible, a player who you can use in two or three positions. Which you're going to need this middle yourself because it's never going to be perfect, and sometimes you're going to need that sort of interchange. So uh, we'll finish off with just a bit of chat about the upcoming fixtures. So I think the next time we do a show will be uh, this month will be over. So we'll, we'll have had at least three games under our belt. So we're looking at. Reading away, which Philippa, I know you're hopefully going on the coach down to Reading. Uh, and then we've got two big games then on Sky in Chelsea away and Everton away, uh, Everton at home, sorry, at Anfield, which will be quite exciting. So, how are you, how are you seeing these games then, Philippa? Uh, yeah, I mean, Reading for me is one. Um, you know, I'd like us to get three points there just to get us off to a good start. Um, I think it's a team we can compete with this season. Um, I don't think we should be going there afraid of of them. Um, and that's not to say that I don't think they're a decent side, because I do. It's just they're the sort of side that I think we're going to be in and around come the end of the season. So if we can go there and be really competitive and, and come away with the three points, that stands us in good stead. Because um, we have got a, a pretty tough start. The first six games mm. um, are really tough. Um, so... You know, we're saying we're not going to be in a relegation battle. None of us, you know, believe that. But, you know, there is a, a chance that we could be down there at the end of those six games um, and we need not to panic. Um, and then, you know, Chelsea at home and and it's kind of like a free hit. <laughs> um, you know, I don't expect us to, to, to really get any points there, but you never know. You know, we, we showed last season how good we were defensively and how solid we were. And I'm sure Matt will have a clear plan for that game. Um, you know, and it, maybe it's a good time to be playing Chelsea at the start of the season before they've really got into the flow. Um, and then the the Anfield derby, um, which I'm very, very excited about and uh, want as many people there as possible. Um, I think, you know, Everton are, are a strange side. Um, you know, last season they, they made a lot of big signings, I would say, that didn't quite come off for them. Um, and it's difficult to know how they'll perform this season. You know, if if having the new manager in, I think something like the third or fourth manager that they've had in just over 12 months, um, you know, how they'll go with that. Um, and maybe we can take advantage of them not really being settled just yet. Um, so, yeah, very, very interesting first three games, I would say. But uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Uh, how about you, Emma? You look forward to all three. Uh, will, you be going, will you be going to the derby? Yeah, I'll be working on the derby. Um, not sure about the Chelsea game. I, I don't think I will be doing that now. I think originally I was looking to work that, but I think I'll be on Premier League that day now. So, um, yeah, I, I, I won't be at the Reading game. Um, but again, like Philippa, really interesting. I think all three are very different. Um, I actually think Everton are going to be seriously dangerous this season um, from what I've seen throughout the summer and speaking to people at the club and, um, you know, kind of the, the reputation of the, the new manager, it just feels like a completely different club this summer. And I think they've finally got the, the right man in that they've sort of been looking for for almost a year now. So um, they've got some real quality. So if they can hit the ground running, I think Everton could could be a really tough game at Anfield, unfortunately. But hopefully, um, because it is, you know, earlier in the season, Liverpool, because they are a more well-established team, um, in terms of you know the time that they spent together, hopefully they can they can maybe um, have have a good hit at Everton before they get going, if that makes sense. Um, Chelsea, as Philippa says, I think for me Chelsea are a level above everyone in the league, so 
if if Liverpool get anything out of the, that game, then that's that that would be an unbelievable result. Um, Reading again, another really interesting one because in my um, WSL predictions, I've actually put Reading quite high. Um, maybe a lot of people were quite surprised by that, but um, I think it's the first summer where they've actually kind of kept the same group of players, and they always seem to overachieve. I think everyone sort of um, underestimates Reading, so um, I think I think that's a really really tough first game, especially away from home. Um, so yeah, I think if Liverpool don't come out of those three games without any points, I won't be too concerned because I do think that that's that's a really really tough start to the season. Um, but yeah, I'd certainly be looking at Reading just to you know maybe either get a point out of them. Um, I think I think would be fine. And yeah, and as I say, you know just have a go at Everton at, at Anfield and, and and see what you can do. I think on Reading, what's interesting is that last season they won the home games against Brighton, Villa, Leicester. And Birmingham, um, mm-hmm. who finished seventh, ninth, eleventh, and twelfth, respectively. They went to Goodison and won in the second half of the season, but they did lose. Uh, not to Goodison, sorry. They went to Everton and won, uh, Walton Hall Park and won, and they they did lose to uh, Everton uh, in a, in an early-ish home game earlier in the season. So I think you know, in amongst all of that, that tells you a little bit of a story around the level that that they're at and, and how much of an achievement just going there and getting a point would actually be for, for this Liverpool side in this moment. And again, this is back to us understanding what's a good result. And I think it's important not to just sort of look at Reading and do that. I'm intrigued by the fact that Emma's, you know, predicted them to finish very, very high because she knows a lot more about other sides than I do. But I think just looking at last season's outcomes there, that you know, if they retain those players and have that level of stability, then they'll they'll fancy that and they'll they'll be backing themselves. I think I think Liverpool have got a They've got to embrace that moment against Everton at Anfield. I think it'll be important, and I think it, it'll be important in, in a number of ways, not least because we, you know, we hope, and you know, there'll be work done towards ensuring the crowds as big as humanly possible. So, I'm um, I'm of the view that if they could get four points from those first three, that'd be absolutely tremendous, yeah. and would offer tons and tons of stability and tons and tons to build on from that point. The worry if they don't get anything from the first three is actually the three that follow. Um, because you know what what this doesn't need to feel as though is one that's slipping away. So I think I think it's all about solidity for these. And you know, going back to what we were saying earlier on, you know, this I'm not expecting free flowing football with with wing backs absolutely flying forwards and, and and producing great chances for each other. I think the idea that Liverpool are a pretty compact back seven and looking to just get bits in attack uh, when the moment emerges, I think will matter and. So, yeah, I mean, I'd be delighted with four points. I'd be happy with three, uh, especially if the three came uh, in, in in the derby. And then I think I think it would be good for all if they are able to show that they're competitive against Chelsea for as long as possible. I think the reality of that game against Chelsea is I actually think I think the last that I think the last half an hour could be quite brutal uh, from a Liverpool mm. point of view for two reasons. One is that you know Chelsea's Chelsea's level of fitness, obviously, the sheer quality, but they're going to bring five really good players on. They're going to bring five, like five players who would all start every game for Liverpool are going to come on for Chelsea in that last half an hour. And that's, that, that's worth bearing in mind. You know, we, we get to see when Liverpool do that on the men's side, you know, sometimes they're going to bring, Chelsea are going to bring on five players who would probably all be Liverpool's best player. Yeah. And that, and when they're coming on, when you've done hard, an hour's running against these other brilliant players, and if you've hung on in for dear life, which I, I'm optimistic Liverpool may well be able to do, you know, it wouldn't surprise me to see a scoreline that looked pretty respectable and a showing that felt respectable for the first hour become a four nil. You know, it wouldn't surprise me to see it go one nil to four nil over the course of that set that, that, uh, the, the back end of that game. And again, within that, what we'll need to do when and when people are talking about it, when they go in the games, when they're taking new people, is tell them that story. Say it'd be amazing if Liverpool are only one nil down on the hour mark. Say it'll be amazing if they manage to keep the game alive for as long as they possibly can. Say that these these women that Chelsea are bringing on, they're the best ones in the world. They've got some of the literally the best ones. Um, that's what you firstly you're privileged to get to watch them at Prenton Park, but also secondly, you know, the idea that being sticking in there with them for as long as they possibly can is a good thing and is a pathway thing and is a journey thing. And I think if they can do all that, keep that, keep that game, keep that game within the realms of the realms of decency on the one hand and look to get three or four points from the other two on the other, that's that's something you build on. Very well, thought. Right, so just before we go, uh, it's scrolling on the bottom. Uh, our charity, uh, which we talk about in every show now, is Bobby's Wish to Walk. So uh, the link will be in the description below. If you can donate, please please do. If you can't, just 
share it on share it with everyone at the moment i think he's at just over 130k so we're about 20k shows uh just send this lad to america so we, he can um be able to walk again uh, you you've seen the stuff we did with uh, sienna if you haven't if you go to instagram look at sienna steps uh she actually started school last week and actually walked into school which a year ago a moment i didn't think that would be possible so it is possible so that's all we ask for i don't need anything else likes or shares you know they're all great but just donate to Bobby's Wish to Walk. If you can't donate, just share it amongst your friend group. That's all we ask for. And any any little help. So, but thank you very much, Philippa. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Neil. Uh, I really enjoy doing these shows. These are these are always good. These are always good fun. And I will no doubt get you guys back soon. Until then, guys, we'll speak to you soon. Thank you.